Hello, and welcome to this KubeCon talk, where we will discuss our experiences at Databricks, integrating our platform with Azure Private Link over IPv6. I'm Mike Wiederhold, and I'm an engineering manager at Databricks, and I'm presenting with Mei-Shing Li, who is a senior software engineer who led the Private Link integration. During this talk, I will give an overview of the Databricks architecture at a high level and talk about what Private Link is and why it's important to customers running production systems in cloud environments. After that, Mei Xing will discuss some of the challenges we faced when integrating Private Link, how we eventually did our integration, and then show a demo of how customers can access Databricks over Private Link. Before we dive into the Databricks architecture, I first want to talk a little bit about Databricks and the platform we offer to customers. Maybe you've heard about Databricks and know a little bit about what we do, but if you haven't, uh, then you've probably at least heard of Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is a general purpose analytics engine uh, that was created by the founders of Databricks, and it's used for all kinds of large scale analytics jobs, ranging from BI workloads to machine learning. While Apache Spark by itself is a great product, it, like all other distributed analytics engines, can be time consuming to manage when you have large clusters. There are also a lot of different types of software you need to manage outside of your analytics engine, like notebooking software, experiment tracking software if you're doing machine learning, and so on. Databricks realized this early on and built a software as a service platform that runs in the cloud to manage all this complexity for you. This means that your data scientists can focus on what they're good at, which is writing analytics jobs, and not on maintaining infrastructure, which is not in their area of expertise. Since Databricks was founded in 2013, the platform has grown exponentially and is used by many Fortune 500 companies for mission critical applications. As use of this platform has grown, so is Databricks. Today, we have over 6,000 customers, more than 1,500 employees, over 300 of which are engineers, and we have 350 million in annual recurring revenue. So why is Databricks so popular? Uh, as I just mentioned, we provide a unified analytics platform that allows customers to be able to easily write analytics jobs to get value out of their data. While the company originally started out as a company built around Apache Spark, we have since started incorporating other types of analytics engines into our product, like TensorFlow, so that you have a choice of analytics engines to run jobs on. Our platform is also multi-cloud and runs in AWS and Azure. We provide built-in notebooking and reporting and allow customers to easily spin up and spin down Spark clusters in a cost-effective way. This allows data scientists, data engineers, and business users to focus entirely on the things they're good at and not have to worry about the details of the underlying platform. So how did we build this platform? Well, Databricks consists of both a control plane and a data plane. The control plane is where customers log into Databricks and it allows customers to manage users, manage Spark clusters, create notebooks, set up jobs to run periodically, and so on. The Databricks, uh, the data plane is where the Spark clusters run. And you may have noticed in the diagram that there is one control plane and a lot of data planes. There's a reason for this. And it's because Databricks uses what's known as the NVPC model. This means that the control plane runs in the Databricks cloud account, but the data plane runs in the customer's cloud account. The advantage of building your system this way is that a customer's data never needs to leave their account. This is particularly important for security sensitive customers. Our control plane is built on top of Kubernetes uh, and we leverage a variety of different open source projects such as Envoy, MLflow, Koalas, Nginx, Console, Redis, MLflow, Prometheus, CoreDNS, Jaeger, and so on. We also write our services in Scala and Python. Databricks also doesn't just operate a single control plane. We operate many control planes all around the world and across multiple clouds. In fact, we operate over 2,000 Kubernetes clusters worldwide, which are accessed by over 100,000 users. These control planes manage hundreds of thousands of Spark clusters every day and launch millions of VMs to execute customer submitted Spark jobs. These Spark jobs process exabytes of data in order to produce reports and other business insights that are used by customers. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Private Link. Uh, what is Private Link and why did we integrate with it? Well, it turns out that even though customer data never leaves the customer's cloud account due to our NVPC model, some security sensitive customers are still concerned about the results of their jobs or other potentially sensitive information stored on in our platform being sent over the public internet, even if all of it is encrypted during transit. 
They want to be able to guarantee that communication to Databricks never occurs over the public internet and also want to limit access so their Databricks accounts are only accessible through specific endpoints in their cloud network. In order to provide this level of security, all major cloud providers offer a service called PrivateLink. At a high level, PrivateLink has two components to it, a PrivateLink service and a PrivateLink endpoint. PrivateLink service is configured as part of the load balancer that allows traffic into your VNet and ultimately to your application. PrivateLink endpoint is in Databricks case, set up in the customer's account and provides an IP address and DNS name that can only be routed to from inside the customer's cloud network. As part of the private link endpoint setup, you specify a private link service that the endpoint sends traffic to. Traffic between the private link endpoint and private link service always goes over cloud providers' private internet, giving customers a more secure way to access their cloud resource without any communication ever leaving their cloud accounts. All right, so that's a brief uh, overview of private link. Um, and uh, I'll hand the presentation off now to Mei Xing. Uh, and he'll talk about the challenges we faced at Databricks integrating private link and how we solved those challenges. He'll conclude the talk with a demo showing a Databricks workspace being accessed over private link. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mei Xing. And next, I will share our journey to integrate with Azure Private Link. Uh, as you can see in the diagram, uh, one, if you want to use Azure Private Link, you need to first provision one uh, private endpoint within your virtual network, then connect the private endpoint to the private link service inside the service provider's virtual network, in this case, uh, Databricks virtual network. And then you can send your traffic to this private endpoint inside your VNet, which is a local kind of IPv4 address. Then Azure Private Link will take care of the traffic routing using Azure networking instead of the public uh, uh, internet. Then send the traffic to the private link service uh, inside the Databricks uh, uh, VNet. That's how the traffic is uh, more secure and uh, more private. Um, so at Databricks, we have several use case to integrate with Azure Private Link to benefit our customers. Uh, the first use case, which we will focus uh, mostly in this uh, talk, is uh, the user to web application traffic. So user can set up uh, a private link endpoint inside their virtual network. And uh, uh, through Private Link, they can talk to the Databricks control plan uh, web application. Yeah, they can use the notebook there to launch the clusters, do all the data science work. Now, there are other use cases like uh, uh, Databricks control plan to Databricks, like a data plan uh, communication can also be secured uh, through the private link uh, feature. So uh, what is the challenge uh, on the infrastructure side to integrate with uh, private link? Um, so first of all, uh, Databricks is a first party service on Azure. Uh, what does that mean? So actually it's called Azure Databricks. So it's uh, appear as a native service in Azure. Uh, so creating a Databricks workspace is uh, as easy as creating um, other resource, for example, virtual machines and a database in Azure. You just need to go through several clicks then you can uh, create uh, a Databricks Bricks workspace to work on. Um, so from Azure side, they provide two types of private link support models. First is the uh, third party offering, uh, which is available to all the Azure customers. And um, it's purely on um, IPv4. So um, the, second, uh, uh, the second type of support model is called the PaaS version of uh, private link. Uh, it definitely provides deeper integration with other Azure services. Uh, so all the other like uh, first party service on Azure, they all use a PaaS version of uh, private link. Uh, so even though it appears to the customer as routed over IPv4, like shown in the previous diagram, um, you connect it to your um, to the private link uh, endpoint uh, in your VNet, which is a local IPv4 address. But actually, the traffic routed by Azure networking is uh, um, carried over IPv6 between these two VNets. And that's the past version of uh, private link. 
Uh, as uh, first body, so it's on Azure, we have to use the past version of uh, private link. Um, so the challenge for us is uh, basically uh, there's a requirement you have to accept uh, uh, IPv6 traffic on the control plane um, to uh, make the uh, private link traffic work. So from Azure side, they do have um, a lot of IPv6 support on uh, most of their uh, resources in terms of uh, VNet, uh, virtual network, uh, subnet, load balancer, uh, VMSS, which is virtual machine skill set. Uh, these resources all support the dual stack, like uh, you can assign both IPv4 and the IPv6 to these resource at the same time. Um, so the challenge for us is really um, our control plan, so it's as uh, shown before, right? we completely run on top of Kubernetes, which is purely IPv4 at this point. Also, um, the, but the private link traffic coming in as IPv6 traffic. So we have to accept IPv6 traffic um, to our Kubernetes um, services. And there are two high level options to solve this problem. The first is uh, the proxy solution. Uh, we can convert the IPv6 to IPv4 traffic outside of Kubernetes, and uh, then just talk IPv4 to the Kubernetes services. Uh, the other option is just uh, support IPv6 natively in Kubernetes. So the IPv6 private link traffic can directly hit a uh, service uh, running on Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the background of uh, uh, running Kubernetes at Databricks. So um, at Databricks, uh, we run all the control plane service on Kubernetes, but we are not using the manager Kubernetes service for example, AKS, um, mainly because Databricks is multi-cloud. Yeah, we want to be consistent across all different cloud providers. So uh, we bake our own like virtual machine images and uh, we make sure uh, these VMs can uh, bootstrap into Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and we have a lot, um, more control over that. We can make sure it has the same like a kernel OS version, Kubernetes version, and um, yeah, it's easier to support our own services. Uh, in terms of the configuration, uh, we totally disabled the IPv6 from the kernel level because we don't need that uh, before supporting private link. And the CNI plugin, we're using Flannel. Uh, the container runtime is Docker. The version we're running is uh, um, Kubernetes version we're running is uh, a V1.16. Uh, the load balancer in Azure is a little bit different from like a load balancer settings in uh, AWS or GCP. Uh, so basically in Azure, there's uh, one single load balancer and all the Kubernetes uh, load balancer service is added as uh, like a load balancer rules on the same load balancer. So uh, we first uh, explored the first option, like uh, a proxy solution outside Kubernetes. Um, cluster. Uh, this solution is also used by some other like Azure internal service. Um, so the um, basic idea is uh, uh, simple. Right? Uh, within the same VNet, we can provision a dedicated uh, load balancer, which accepts the IPv6 private link traffic. Uh, this load balancer can send traffic to a backend like a, a VMSS, a virtual machine a skill set. Then we can run the uh, private link proxy on this uh, um, VMSS, uh, which will terminate the IPv6 traffic um, proxy to IPv4, then again, talking to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so the Kubernetes cluster load balancer also serving the uh, public traffic, uh, which is IPv4 uh, from the rest of the users. Um, so this seems to be a um, straightforward solution. Um, but there are a lot of challenges, actually. Um, the first question is, uh, how can we deploy this uh, uh, proxy? Um, do we deliver it as a virtual machine image because it's run on top of a virtual machine skill set? Yeah, do we deliver as a virtual machine image or a container image? Uh, it is completely outside of Kubernetes, right? So um, how do we actually deploy it? Uh, we cannot use uh, like a kubectl commands. Uh, maybe we can run some Docker commands if we run as a container, or maybe we just deploy the virtual machine uh, using the virtual machine image. 
but we don't have this support model. Right? It will be a completely new kind of uh, service um, 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 we support. And uh, the other question is how um, how we monitor this service, right? Uh, the metrics, logins, and uh, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, we only have native support from Kubernetes. Uh, we don't have um, such a use case like uh, a, a virtual machine skill set outside the Kubernetes and then provide the metrics and logins. So these are the uh, problems uh, um, to use this proxy solution. Um, then uh, because of that, we also explore the second option, uh, which is to support Kubernetes uh, natively with IPv6. Um, so um, because we still need to serve IPv4 traffic for the public uh, like access, uh, which is not through private link. So we have to use the uh, dual stack feature uh, in Kubernetes uh, if we choose to have native uh, IPv6 support. Uh, if we use that feature, dual stack, on the load balance level, we uh, can accept both IPv6 and v4. The uh, overall architecture looks uh, like a simpler, uh, which is good. Um, however, it, this uh, option has its own challenges. The first, uh, um, the, the first item is like uh, the stability concern. Um, the version we are running on uh, 1.16 Kubernetes, uh, the dual stack feature is just an alpha feature. Um, so dual stack is uh, targeting beta, uh, to be beta in uh, 1.20. Um, so uh, it's uh, not a good idea to run one uh, to enable a alpha feature in the production workload. Uh, second uh, item is like uh, this uh, option seems to be an overkill uh, because we only need uh, IPv6 support at uh, the front end, maybe several services and uh, um, like uh, pods will require IPv6 support. But most uh, of our Kubernetes workload will not require IPv6. Uh, at last, it could be a huge engineering effort right? uh, about prototyping and testing um, to make sure everything works if we enable the dual stack feature uh, in Kubernetes. Yeah, but we do. Uh, we did uh, some um, investigation on like uh, running the dual stack on Kubernetes. Yeah, first of all, um, don't confuse with like uh, IPv6 single stack feature in Kubernetes, uh, which already entered the alpha in uh, 1.9 and uh, moved to beta in 1.18. Uh, yeah, so the dual stack is different from the uh, single stack feature, and uh, uh, the dual stack feature uh, started. Uh, uh, as alpha in 1.16, uh, but when we talking to the contributors, uh, it seems like uh, this feature is mostly stable right now. Uh, the reason it's not uh, um, promoted to the beta uh, is mostly due to some pending discussion on the service APIs. Actually, that will not affect our use case uh, for the dual stack. Yeah, and uh, once you enable the dual stack, uh, it will assign both IPv4 and the v6 uh, IP to uh, literally every pods running Kubernetes. Um, but for the service level, uh, you need to have separate service um, for like one for IPv4 and the one um, dedicated service for IPv6. Um, yeah, uh, to run the dual stack, there's also some networking prerequisites. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, the Kubernetes node, the host level, you must have the dual stack support. Uh, yeah, this is uh, not surprising. And uh, Azure VMSs uh, already support this. They can have dual stack support. Um, second, um, because every pod will have both IPv4 and IPv6 um, address. So the uh, container networking interface you choose, the CNI, must support the dual stack as well. Uh, as we are using Flannel, actually Flannel will not support a dual stack feature. Um, the like a uh, mm, known uh, CNI plugins can uh, better support the dual stack feature, uh, Kubernetes and uh, Calico. Uh, but this um, case, it's case by case uh, on different cloud providers. It's not guaranteed to work like uh, on multi clouds. So after we explore this dual stack uh, possibility on Kubernetes, um, actually we go back to the proxy solution. 
looks like a proxy solution is a better option in the short term. Then we try to revisit our proxy solution. <coughs> yeah, can we combine the uh, above two options together? Uh, whether it's possible to move the proxy into the Kubernetes. Then um, if we do that, we will definitely get the um, deployment and the monitoring kind of for free. Yeah, we know how to deploy uh, Kubernetes workload and we have native like uh, metrics logging in the Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so on the load balancer level, it does support dual stack. So basically, even if we use one uh, load balancer, it can support both IPv4 and v6 traffic. So we can combine them into one. Uh, the virtual machine skill set, it also supports dual stack. Uh, actually, only the flannel, uh, the Kubernetes uh, CNI network is not supporting the dual stack. Uh, so is it possible to deploy the proxy as the like, pods on Kubernetes? Um, but give the virtual machine um, level networking to the pods. Uh, yeah, there are definitely um, some feature called uh, use host network, uh, where to work for the dual stack. Yeah, that's uh, um, the third option we're trying to explore. We don't know whether it works or not. Um, then we prototype it, and, uh, um, and luckily it uh, works pretty well. Um, so um, here comes to our solution. Yeah, basically, um, to make it uh, work end to end, right? So well, we first need to make sure IPv6 is um, populated everywhere on this Azure uh, cloud provider uh, infrastructure. So first, uh, provisioning IPv6 on the VNet subnet and uh, uh, load balancer at the IPv6 IP, and then create a, a virtual machine skill set. Uh, we create with a special uh, image that we enable the IPv6 in this uh, virtual machine image. Then it can have the dual stack, uh, which can be later on used by the um, proxy pods running on top. Uh, yeah, to provision the VMSS with, with dual stack, if you use uh, Azure uh, Provider 2.0 with Terraform, you can use the Terraform resource. Uh, otherwise, you can always use uh, AZCLI to attach a IPv6 uh, uh, interface to the VMSS. Yeah, then uh, we set a load balancer to only load balance traffic to this uh, uh, VMSS, uh, which enabled uh, IPv6. Uh, so once the uh, traffic hit the IPv6 IP on the load balancer, it's only go to this VMSS. And uh, inside the Kubernetes, we also have a dedicated node pool for this VMSS so that uh, only the proxy workload will, uh, will um, run on this node pool, not uh, interfering with other Kubernetes uh, um, workloads. Um, yeah, so oh, then we deploy the private link proxy, which is a, a v6 to v4 proxy as a general Kubernetes deployment to that uh, uh, dedicated node pool. Um, yeah, we set it to use the host networking, um, it, it actually yeah get both like uh, IPv4 and the v6 uh, uh, interface, and the proxy is just a Nginx proxy listening on the port four four three. So if you use host networking and uh, enable the pod security policy, yeah, just make sure yeah you specify the policy to allow the pods to use host network. Um, then, yeah, make sure the load balancer rules are correctly configured to um, send the traffic to this proxy pod. Uh, and also make sure uh, you do the proper whitelisting on the private link uh, um, traffic so that um, v4, uh, v6 traffic can come into um, your Kubernetes. And then, yeah, the proxy works. Um, so we got a lot of benefit from this uh, solution. Uh, so first of all, it's uh, straightforward, easy to troubleshoot. Um, then it's uh, the deployment is managed by Kubernetes. Right? It's very easy if we want to update uh, the proxy, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, deployed as a stateless uh, deployment. So as the traffic load increase, uh, it's very easy to scale up. Uh, just increase the uh, pod replica. We can handle more traffic. Um, next item is like uh, uh, we definitely get the Kubernetes native monitoring and logging. Uh, yeah, at last, uh, this solution will also work for other use case. For example, our data plan to control plan um, traffic using private link. 
Uh, yeah, this is uh, some screenshot as a demo. Um, so we provisioned this uh, private link uh, uh, node pool inside the Kubernetes cluster, uh, which is a special VMSS, uh, except uh, like uh, both v4 and v6 traffic. So when you deploy the um, proxy pod, yeah, just make sure uh, have the host networking and make sure it's uh, scheduled on this um, um, a private link node pool. Um, if we look at the uh, network on the pod level, uh, we exact into the pod, you can see both uh, IPv4 and uh, v6 IP. Yeah, on, on the virtual machine on the pod level, it's uh, completely a uh, private IP and uh, a public IP is only available on the Azure load balancer level. Uh, so it's the same like a uh, uh, network interface if you look on the host VM. Um, so on the Azure uh, load balancer side, if we look at the IP, yeah, we're provisioning the a, um, IPv6 uh, for this purpose. And uh, um, then it works. Uh, when we set up the private link, uh, if you, you are within your user like a VNet, uh, you look for this uh, um, URL, um, it will return you a local IP address. You just need to connect that to this local IP address. Actually, it will show the uh, Azure Databricks workspace. Then, yeah, things got work. Your traffic is routed uh, through the private link. Yeah, to recap, yeah, not necessary to integrate with uh, Azure private link, but if you need need any like uh, uh, IPv6 traffic support in your like uh, IPv4 Kubernetes, uh, yeah, then uh, you can you can use this approach. Basically, you enable the dual stack always IPv6 everywhere on the cloud provider infra level, right? Then you can set up with the v6 to v4 proxy. Uh, you can just deploy it as regular Kubernetes deployments. Yeah, just uh, to use the host networking, then you can uh, receive the IPv6 traffic. And then you can proxy to v4, and then um, the route will work uh, um, all the way to your Kubernetes. Yeah, this is a uh, um, I think a good way to support IPv6 traffic um, with uh, IPv4 uh, Kubernetes if you don't want to use the uh, dual stack feature yet. Um, so yeah, um, we delivered this uh, Azure Databricks uh, private link is in private preview now, uh, and it's also available in Azure GovCloud. This concludes our KubeCon talk. Hopefully it's useful to you. Thank you very much for joining our talk. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, thank you.